let's talk a little bit about about scaling. Um, you know, you, you you have again, you have this reputation for coming into companies that are growing kind of exponentially and helping them to grow even faster. Um, well, it's really just because I pick them well. They were, were going to grow anyway. <laughs> so, so what, what, is the, what, is the, the, what are the key kind of skill sets that you think you bring to, to uh, helping a company do that? Well, the, I remember when I first started at Square, like, Jack actually asked me to give a kind of speech to the company about what the hell I would be doing. And we were like 20 employees, so it was not really clear what like, a CEO does in a 20 employee <laughs> company. And so I said, the best metaphor I can think of is kind of like a hospital room um, triaging which is there's always something broken in a startup. Like things are chaotic, things are a mess. And there's things that look like they're cold, but they actually could be fatal if you don't sort of address them and fix them. And there's things that look like they're problems, but actually they're just like a cold and they're gonna kind of go away and they won't be annoying like long term. Same thing on the positive side, which is, I don't know what the right metaphor is because it's not really triaging, but there's things that look like they're really interesting and potentially compelling, but they're really a distraction. And conversely, there's things that are a distraction or look like a distraction, but they actually could be really compelling and they're kind of a gem. And so the hard part of scaling is kind of figuring those things out mm -hmm. because every, everything really is chaotic. And so it's like, what are you going to embrace and how and why? And then how do you leave it in a place that doesn't come back the next day with another cold that could be fatal? And so like, you have to find the right person to manage it, kind of put the concrete down, leave it stable, then go on to the next thing, just constantly sort of fix things. And then over time, if you lay a foundation and everything's fixed, you kind of can build on top of it. But so it's not like really magic. There's no like secret sauce. Uh -huh. Can you give an example of that, of, of what, one of these concrete layers that you had to lay down? Yeah, I mean, there, the, the classic stuff is usually around customer support, to be honest, and it's just top of mind because generally if you're in a low margin business, um, you can't really spend a lot of money um, responding to customers if you're ever going to be profitable. And it's one of the last things that like, founders often think through because you're generally focused on the product, this really cool product, and it's going to be amazing, and it's going to be incredibly intuitive. And then there's corner cases. And the more, you, the more customers you have and the more mass market you're in, the corner cases add up. So like, if it's 10, bit, 10 basis points or 1% of corner cases, that's actually real people. And those real people start tweeting about your product and company. And then you've got to figure out how to respond to them in an elegant way. You've got to figure out how to actually respond to them without using people. Because if you use too many people, you're never going to make money. Even Zappos, which had a reputation um, for using a lot of people in a very high-end customer experience, actually only spent about 2% of their revenue on customer support. Mm -hmm. if, you look, like, if you do the math on your own companies, what percent of revenue are you spending on your customer support? I guarantee it's more than 2% in you know, at least half of your companies. So Zappos figured out how to do it in a moderately scalable way, but that's just a classic example. Mm -hmm. But there's all, all kinds of what, things like that that are basically broken. Recruiting is often broken. It's I mean, the marketplace is incredibly competitive, so it's very difficult to be incredibly successful at recruiting. But usually when you're a small company, you're probably not like competing with all of the other best companies and getting all of the best people. Like one, one thing I still aspire to do and I have 20 years, I guess, to pull this off is to get a monopoly on talent. Mm -hmm. I've mean, never figured out exactly how to pull that off, but uh, one day I will figure it out. Cool. So um, you, I, you, you have a, a well-deserved reputation for getting a tremendous amount done uh, at, the, at, you know, at, at the companies that you work at. And, and I think that you have a history of, you know, as you leave companies, they have to hire three or four people <laughs> in your wake to do what it was that, that you were doing. Um, I, I know you put in a lot of hours, but it's not just, a lot of people put in a lot of hours. Um, what is it that, that, that you think allows you to scale personally so tremendously and get so much done? So I think it's fundamentally hiring the right people, and that sounds easy, but it's actually really, really hard. So if you think about people, I think there's two categories of good people. Um, there's like ammunition and there's barrels. And so you can add all the ammunition you want, but if you only have five barrels in your company, you can literally only do five things simultaneously. If you add one barrel, you can suddenly do a six. If you add another one, you can do a seven. So finding those barrels that you can shoot through, and that really, a barrel that you can shoot through is really someone who can take an idea from conception to live, and it's almost perfect. And they can pull people with them, they can charge up the hill, they can motivate people, and they can edit themselves. Those are really hard to find, but the ratio of ammunition to barrels is pretty important. And any any one barrel you find, you should hire instantly, regardless of whether you have money for them, whether you or her, whether you have a role for them. Um, so that's one is just keeping that in mind and finding those barrels. Second thing is, um, I think like Paul Graham sort of said it well, which is 
every marginal person you hire, you should try to find someone who's kind of relentlessly resourceful. Mm -hmm. And I think that phrase is really good. I used to use, before you had that blog post, I used to use the phrase like tenacious, mm -hmm. but relentlessly resourceful is a little bit better. And there's just people like we were talking about, my uh, former intern right. who at 19 years old was better than 80% of the rest of my company at just getting stuff done. And it was actually really easy to tell that from like the second day he was at Square. I asked him to do a kind of trivial project, fairly mon actually incredibly mundane, which is people were working really hard and really late over the summer. And I said, it'd be great f to give people smoothies at 9 o'clock at night. And I try to get this through our HR group. I try to get like my executive assistant to do this. And for whatever set of reasons, it never worked. Like either smoothies were bad, they were warm, they weren't delivered on time, just a mess. So I talked to my intern, and it was like, it'd be great if we had like, smoothies at 9 o'clock. And they, they actually tasted good, and people liked it, because it was kind of desired to be a reward. And then that night, they showed up, and they were good. And I was like, wow, like, maybe I can give them like, real stuff to do. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the smoothie test. It's smoothie yeah, test, okay. exactly. Um, and, and so, one, it, so the, the, there's a challenge in hiring like the barrels, right? But, there's, but is, do you also find, I, what I see often is there's a challenge in then figuring out how to define the part of what used to be your role that now is the barrel's role. And how do you, how do you manage that and, and you know, build, you know, have that, that layer of trust and that kind of give them that responsibility, give them ownership, at the same time maintaining the control that you want to maintain? Well, so the best answer is hopefully they can do all of your job. <laughs> it's literally great if you wake up one day and like you have five people, let's say, that are reporting to you and they can do your job like, you know, and you're only, almost doing nothing, that would be amazing. That's mm -hmm. pretty rare. Um, but what you can do is, Jack actually had a metaphor, which I really, really liked, and I was surprised. I don't think anybody had really used it in the Valley before a couple years ago, which is editing. And that your job as an executive is actually to edit, not to write. And every time you do something, you should think through in your brain, am I writing or am I editing? And you should immediately be able to tell the difference. And it's okay to write once in a while, like per part of the organization. But if you're writing on a consistent basis in marketing or in legal or on product or customer acquisition or whatever the case is, or HR or recruiting, there's a fundamental problem with that team. And so every time you literally do something, you should say to yourself, am I writing or am I editing? Mm. And get in the position where you're editing. Mm. And so the relationship of an editor is great because what an editor does is not the work product. Like think about a reporter. The reporter's writing the story. The editor may, may ask clarifying questions. The editor may simplify and extract things, you know, edit, uh, delete things, um, or occasionally reorganize things and require follow-up and you know, maybe change the layout. But fundamentally, that's the real role. And then so writers appreciate that. The people doing the work appreciate it because it's their work product, mm -hmm. and they get the reward and psychological satisfaction out of doing the work product. So that's the real test for me, is am I editing and writing and always get into edit mode as fast as possible. So does, but does that editing ever turn into micromanaging? It does, um, <laughs> definitely does. Um, that's, I guess the test is uh, micromanaging is twofold. One is how important is something? Mm -hmm. So you know, there's a famous quip, um, I think was President Truman or Eisenhower, I actually just forgot, was asked like, what the hardest part about being president of the United States was, and he said, learning to sign a bad letter. Mm -hmm. Because like, if you're president of the United States, you really can't take a letter for 80% to perfect um, and, you know, and do your job. Mm -hmm. If something's not that important in the grand scheme of things, you might want to allow for like, the mistake to go through and sort of allow people to learn from it. If it's really important to your business, you can't. And so you have to actually edit that down to be perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so knowing like, how important something is and how critical it is is one thing. Second thing is uh, there are people who just know what they don't know, and there are people who don't. Mm -hmm. And until someone shows the propensity to distinguish between those things, mm -hmm. you can't let them run amok. Once they show that they know the difference and know where they're kind of approaching that edge, you can let them do anything. Mm -hmm. So literally, you know, same intern, I could allow him to do anything because he knew exactly what he knew and what exactly what he didn't know. So I could leave him completely unsupervised for days at a time to say, hey, make this happen. And if anything was slightly off or he didn't know how to resolve the answer, I knew he'd go find me or text me and track me down. Mm -hmm. And like, he would never do something that would you know, be uh, non-fixable. But it, lots of people don't know that difference, and once if, that line's pretty dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so if you have someone like that, you've got to be like micromanaging and teach somehow like, until they have that epiphany of what the difference is. Mm -hmm. um, especially if they do external meetings, you can't have sort of someone in the room if they don't really know like, what they should say or not say. Like, so you have to have that editorial filter yourself. Once someone shows that, you can give them a long rope mm -hmm. and let them run. Yeah, okay. So let me switch gears here a little bit and talk about uh, specific, specifically about how you, you ran parts of Square, because I don't know about the other, I, 
I could see you run Square, I couldn't see you run these other companies. But you know, when I started my career eons ago, um, you know, uh, people that weren't executive management were, you know, the, the, the prototypical mushrooms, right? Yeah. Kept in the dark and fed a lot of bullshit, right? <laughs> and 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 at at at, at Square, I was I was always struck by how transparent you were about everything throughout the whole organization. You had these Friday meetings where you would go and you would talk about everything that was happening from, you know, not just like from the product and not just, you know, sales successes, but like fundraising and, you know, all sorts of things that, that uh, would have been unthought of 20 years ago. So, so I mean, what, wh why do you do that and how do you do that and what was the decision process you, you went through to say this is, this is the kind of company we want to be? Sure. So the, the last part is the easiest part to answer. It's actually wasn't very explicit at all. I think both Jack and I had the same exact bias. So we almost never talked about it. It's just obvious that that's how you build a company is you make it incredibly transparent. Reasons why. First thing is if you want people to make decisions, people cannot make smart decisions if they don't have context and information. So if you want people to like, make the same decisions you would make, but in a scalable way, high leverage way, you have to give them the same information you have or they're gonna make different decisions and then you're gonna be frustrated. Mm -hmm. So transmitting all of the data from you know, metric, classic metrics, finance metrics, marginal economics, is the only way you can teach people to make smart decisions and scale. So that actually, we did that at PayPal. Peter used to hand out, like back to date ourselves, spreadsheets, mm -hmm. like Excel spreadsheets with all of the numbers of PayPal. Mm -hmm. And like we literally to sit in a meeting like this, this is the company meeting, it was, got kind of boring at some point, but basically you go line by line through the spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, really excited. The first couple of meetings were kind of cool and then doing that every month for like two years got a little dry. Um, but then he actually got it really interesting when we were a public company, Peter had to fight our lawyers because the lawyers didn't want to allow for like the revenue and things like that to be transmitted to the entire company for like insider trading reasons. And Peter pushed back pretty aggressively and we got to a pretty good compromise where basically we left all the metrics and stripped out the revenue line, although of course you could calculate it. Um, so it wasn't quite as, <laughs> yeah, it's like lawyer, lawyer, <laughs> lawyer, lawyers aren't quite that smart sometimes. But um, in any event, Peter, Peter added, like it was really a top-down fight with like lawyers to allow us to continue that practice. So at Square, what we did is that on steroids, gave everybody access to all information, you know, have dashboards throughout the organization, broadcasting everything. But took that one step forward is how to, have a full company meeting every Friday for an hour long, and we go through like the entire board deck, like slide by slide. Um, you know, and, and the only thing probably stripped out is like option grants. And even that, I've actually wondered whether you should actually build a company where those are those are transparent too. Um, for every company meeting that has more than two people, someone sends a set of notes for the meeting to the entire company. So there's an alias like notes at, and so there's a complete you know transparency. All the conference rooms are, you know, intentionally designed with glass so that everybody sees, like, so there's no secret meetings and everybody's wondering, like, who's meeting with who and why they're doing it. Kept everybody on the same floor as long as possible and still, um, you know, the new Square office will have the largest floor plate in San Francisco, 110,000 square feet. So you can keep everybody so everybody can see each other, everybody can kind of understand what everybody's doing. As soon as you split offices to multiple floors, politics start creeping in, which is another reason to have a transparent culture other than improved decision making is, one way to avoid politics is having everybody have the same information. And I saw like this blog post yesterday from Stripe, which is actually pretty interesting, where they have all, all their email goes to everybody. And it's actually pretty, I actually think I'm somewhat sympathetic to that. Now, it obviously has perverse effects. People will change from email to text, or they'll change from email to IM. So it, do, it doesn't quite like avoid like non-public conversations within the office. But uh, I'm, I'm ideologically fairly sympathetic to like taking that one step further. Mm -hmm. Steve Jobs tried it next to have transparent compensation. Uh, they had two two levels, um, like it's like eighty thousand and hundred thousand or something like that. Um, it didn't quite work out so well, but that was like nineteen ninety seven. Maybe maybe like it's worth like revisiting that. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because he was not known for transparency at all. No, exactly. Well, yeah, it's like yeah, like there's an old book written about Next. It's pretty interesting actually to read in retrospect. Uh huh. So and, and but but I mean there had to be things that you couldn't share, right? And so I mean I mean not that well I mean much. you, you I couldn't mean, say like um, you know just so you know I'm thinking of firing this guy next. No, week, right? yeah, so, like people stuff so, is the hardest. Right. Um, compensation around people. Um, promotion, well, promotions, but demotions or firing, organizational changes. Organizational changes are difficult uh, to be super transparent about until you're ready to pull the trigger. Because as soon as people sense that something is kind of amiss, all hell breaks loose. No one gets any work done. They all start, everybody starts gossiping. Right. Like, what the hell's going on? You know, you blah, 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 blah. And like, so you have like a week of like nobody doing any work. So I think that stuff's pretty hard to be super transparent until you have it all figured out and then, then you announce it. Uh -huh. it so there are, there are some things like that, but generally speaking, I think people overrate. Like we would tell people, per your point, 
if we were going to raise financing, we would talk to the company in advance to say, here's the terms we want, here's the people we're talking to. If we got a term sheet, we say we got a term sheet, even though like it wasn't signed, sealed, and delivered. Um, when we were negotiating a Starbucks partnership, literally Howard and team came down fr Friday afternoon in our office, spent a day with them, spent that day with them in the conference room, and our Friday meeting happened and Jack went on stage and a couple, literally after the office with a big Starbucks logo and said, hey, we're negotiating this partnership with Starbucks. I was like, oh shoot, this better work out. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta sign this thing now. Um, so, but there, but that, that kind of culture adds up in a certain sense. And if you wanna inculcate, the other big reason to do it is inculcates a true ownership mentality. Right. I mean, people talk about ownership mentality in you know, companies, but if you really believe it, you kind of have to act that way. Mm -hmm. And did you see that? I mean, other than the, I mean, you didn't talk about notes at, but but did did that permeate? I mean, did you see that transparency kind of rolling out and other people being transparent? And so oh yeah, I, oh absolutely, absolutely. Like it, there's like no, you know, almost basically no secrets. Uh -huh. um, and hopefully it made better decision making. I mean, you can't prove that because it's kind of counterfactual. Uh -huh. Like you don't generally get to run an A/B test with your own company, right. or it's pretty hard to set that up. Right. But I, I suspect it was true. And and did did anything ever get out? Did it, did it... Fortunately, no. I mean. You know, and Square's a kind of high-profile company and has been, you know, for a while. Um, so there's definitely journalists probing all over the place. Um, what, what Jack actually started the company with is a little bit of a clear speech to the company, and I kind of inherited this, was, look, this is a privilege, and we can only do this so long as everybody keeps it confidential. And we all have a commitment to each other, and all of our, you know, sort of families and futures depend upon this. And so if you're going to do anything stupid, like leak something, you're actually threatening, you know, your friends, your family, everything you've worked for. Mm -hmm. um, so the company was pretty good. Insofar as there were ever really leaks from Square, and there weren't very many at all, they used to actually tie back to an investor. Oh, great. <laughs> not, a, not necessarily you. Uh, um, but <laughs> awesome. OK. So we'll move on to a different topic then. Um, so you talked a little bit about hiring, how, how important hiring is. And I'd like to dive in a little bit on, on, on your hiring. And, you, and I love your, your, your notion of like ammunition and barrels. but. Um, one of the things that, you know, you know, kind of, you know, 10, 20, 30 pe person companies are, uh, you know, kind of go back and forth about is when I'm hiring that, that, that next level of executives, um, do I hire people like me or do I hire people that are, that provide diversity? Really tough call. There's like a raging debate about this. I think my, my friend Max Levchin wrote a blog post that's actually pretty controversial where he said, actually, you want to hire people like you. Mm -hmm. which is kind of contrary to the general advice you get. His basic point was, you should read his blog post, um, was first of all, when people are similar and there's enough common bonds, you just actually make better decisions. Like you don't spend nearly as much time on communication and you spend much more time on productive stuff. I think that's true. Maybe the answer is in different stages of the company, you focus on different things and you start with a more tight nucleus that's probably people of similar backgrounds and then you extend over time, as you try to go more mainstream, you want to reflect what mainstream America is like, or mainstream world is like. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. There's a right answer. I think there's trade-offs. Like you just get a lot. Like so, PayPal basically it was impossible to get a job unless you knew somebody, unless you were friends with someone in the company. Mm -hmm. So you just hired through our networks. It worked really well because we were able to tap into people kind of that were a little eclectic, idiosyncratic, slightly different, but hire pretty accurately because of the strong tie. Like, I don't think there was anybody like in the core 250 people in Mountain View that really didn't have at least like a second degree connection that got hired. Mm. So I think that that was very successful for the company, but it probably had some limits too. And so I don't know, I don't know where I net out on this. Like I think there's, I've seen the virtues of both. Like mm. there's definitely times where someone from a very different perspective adds a hell of a lot of value. Um, and then there's times where like, if you don't, I think it's you have to share first, maybe it comes down to, Generally speaking, you want to hire people that share first principles. Hmm. You can't spend too much time fighting over first principles, and first principles involve strategy, they involve people, culture. If you're generally aligned on first principles, then the application of them and the best way to execute against the principles is a really robust, vigorous debate, and that actually is really helpful. But you, you really can get yourself like out of execution and into infinite you know, sort of loops by debating first principles. So like an example of that would be some cultural norms, but um, a better example would be, I happen to believe in sort of vertical integration. Mm -hmm. Happen to believe like more like an Apple, I, Apple approach to life closed than open. So it'd be a bad fit for me to be like working with a whole bunch of people, engineers who believe in open. Mm -hmm. They could just, we're not gonna get anything done. Mm -hmm. Like at the end of the day, now eventually, 
a successful closed system can evolve into an open one as you become sort of mainstream and commoditized. But it's probably better that Jack and I shared the commitment to closed ecosystem, and then therefore we could execute against that and we could hire people who understand that or proselytize and convince them, mm -hmm. then hiring a whole bunch of people and just fighting it out every day. Right. And revisiting our you know, sort of strategy every day. So how does that, and, and you know, there's the, the truism about always hiring A or A plus players, right? So, it, you know, it, 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 so that, and that's different from hiring people that, that share your first principles, right? And so do, do you need that Venn diagram of A players plus first principles? And then does that mean you ever get to actually hire anybody? You <laughs> never right? hire anybody. I mean, <laughs> um, well, the, sort of. I mean, so when Vinod Kosla joined our board, um, his first board meeting, he said something that stuck, stuck with me since and I, I really believe in, which is he said, ultimately, the team you build is the company you build. And I think, I think about that every day. Mm -hmm. of like, you think you're building a technology company, you focus a lot on the product, but ultimately what you're really building is a team and what that quality of that team is will dictate the outcome. And I, I, I think that's fundamentally right. Um, that leads you to focus more on the quality of the people. That said, it's impossible to build an organization of 5,000 people who are all like tr right. true A people. This is not possible. Right. There's some level of scale that that's just not true. And you can pretend it's true, but it, it just isn't possible unless you get this monopoly on talent. Mm -hmm. um, so again, like you go back to central casting too. You say like, hey, I'm kind of a sports fan. So I was like, I would love to hire a third baseman who bats, 300, bats 320, hits 40 home runs, 120 RBIs, and wins a gold glove. Truthfully, there's like two people that do that. Mm -hmm. And so if you set your standard that way, you're just like kidding yourself that you're not, you're not going to really be able to fulfill yourself. So you've kind of got to define what an A is mm -hmm. in a way that you can actually execute against. And I think that means either you hire people who are a less, little less proven, because you can get people that aren't proven yet that may actually be able to bat 320. If you wait, you know, if you wait for the best proven that they bat 320, like, you know, you're gonna compete with every other company on the planet, and are you gonna have like, the best vision, the best resources, the best money? To close that, probably not. But you might be able to hire someone who like three years from today might bat 320 right. with 40 home runs. Um, and you know, one way to get people like that is to get them when they're interns. Like I think we had an intern class of 17 last summer at Square, and I'd probably say the top four interns, you know, were probably better. All four were probably better than 80 to 90 percent of the rest of Square. But the only reason we were able to get them is though they were very, very early in their career, so they didn't have like the work product that could prove that they could deliver at that level. So you make compromises on what parts are proven. You can also hire off spec. You know, you can hire like someone who's net, someone who's done something very different, but you think the skill set will transfer. Actually, I do that a lot. I, I think like sometimes you can find you can the raw abilities are harder are harder to teach and rarer mm -hmm. than the actual skill or discipline. Mm -hmm. And so you take the raw ability and you teach the discipline, so you can fill with a true A player. Um, and yeah, or you hire people that other people won't won't right. touch. Um, <laughs> and then we did a little bit of the hip hop. Like I mean, definitely we hired some pretty <laughs> odd people. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> And uh, I think like the combination of all three is how you can construct a pretty high quality A team. Uh -huh. um, but you have to get really good at evaluate if you're going to follow a, pursue that strategy. You, you have to develop the skill to identify those things mm -hmm. and then be able to move people around in the right ways. And if you don't have that ability, then even that strategy is broken. So is that also how you would hire? I mean, you know, I don't know that there's many functional areas that you're not familiar with, but, but you, you have to hire people in, in all, across all functional areas, and you're not always familiar with all of those functional areas. Do you use that same sort of methodology or a different sort of methodology when you're hiring functional areas you don't, you don't necessarily know? You know, I, I don't know if there's an easy answer. The best answer I've heard is actually, a young founder just taught me this over the summer of the best way to answer this is what he does is, because he doesn't have you know, as much functional expertise outside what he's done before, and he's kind of a first-time founder, and he's doing really, really well, but he said, the what I learned to do is, like, I'll just go interview the best five or have coffee with the best five people who do something. Mm -hmm. So imagine you're hiring a CFO, and you don't know what a, what does a world-class CFO look like? I don't know, never hired one before, never worked one with before, how would you find out? He said, well, I'll just have coffee with the five best CFOs in the Valley, and I'll take notes, mm -hmm. and try to figure out what's common about them, and then I'll go interview people. Now, it's very time consuming to do that, mm -hmm. but it's a great process. Yeah, I mean, like for me, the hardest thing to hire is a VP of engineering. Mm -hmm. Like, I have no idea like, how to hire a VP. <laughs> what I do know is kind of like, you know, if someone's in the top 1%, I might kind of have a feel for that, or in the bottom 20%, but everything else in the middle is like a big black hole. Mm -hmm. So I've either got to find someone to hire that person, or I've got to find a different technique than using my own judgment, because I'm not going to be able to tell. Right. Okay. And then, it, you know, the PayPal team is legendary for being, like you say, this mix of 
you know, Eccentrics. really smart people, eccentric people, <laughs> you know, um, you know, and all sorts of, you know, uh, you know, an interesting group, but very, very good. As PayPal scaled, did you know that you, you often run into these, these situations where someone who's really good for like the early stages of growth and was an amazing contributor is not the same person that, that it can be successful as the company really begins to scale. Did you run into that sort of situation and, and how did you deal with it? So we didn't because Peter had a different philosophy. So Peter's philosophy was he didn't believe in managers basically at the end of the day, like didn't put any value in people who were managers. His real full belief structure was whoever's best at a particular discipline should run that discipline. So whoever's the best product person should run product, whoever's the best engineer should run engineering, whoever's the best business person should run business. And it has a lot of merit. What it means is that you actually have a, you know, arguably meritocratic culture. You actually don't frustrate junior people because they know that the person leading them is actually better at their job than you are. That said, you have tricks because manage, management is a little bit challenging sometimes and it's not like intuitive for some people. But we said so we just totally didn't believe that. We just found the best person and it's like, okay, you're in charge of X. If we find someone who's better at design, then they'll be in charge of design. Mm. Um, and it worked really well, actually. Um, but so, yes, yeah, so we never had that. The, the new test, I think, that I've been convinced of is sort of along the following lines, which is if a function is doing what they should have done like six months ago or a year ago, then you have a problem. If they're doing what they're doing kind of like just in time, it's okay. But when you really have someone who knows what they're doing and is really good, you want them kind of like six months to a year ahead of where you think you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And like it's a, it's a, it, and you're in shock and awe when they, when they are. That's really like the test is more like, are they just in time, or are they behind time, or are they ahead of time? And the more they're, you know, that's kind of a practical test you can apply all the time as opposed to, you can get stuck in like these vague jargonistic terms of like, does this person scale, blah, blah, blah. What does that actually mean? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you know? I think this is a reasonably good like practical test, although it's probably not perfect. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of my new, I just learned this a couple days ago actually. Cool. I'm gonna try to apply this one next time. So um, so one, one last question, um, you're, you're a, a You've been an amazingly successful operator, but also angel investor. So you have an uncanny ability to know what's coming next, or you seem to anyway. So, um, where do you think, where, where do you think the next big thing is coming from? And, and, and for context, we had David Sachs in early this <laughs> morning who was talking about, you know, the I think you know the argument about yeah. you know the vertical integrated silos, and there's no more room for innovation there, and so it's going to happen with things like Uber, where you take a, a, a non-technically enabled space yeah. and make it technically enabled. What, what, what do you think? Where, where are you looking for your next you know, giant win, either on the operating side or the investing side? So David's generally right about most things. I think David's like uh, incredibly brilliant, actually. Um, and he was my boss for most of my time at PayPal. Um, I think he's slightly wrong about that, although the last part of it, the caveat, actually, may persuade me. I, I don't believe that like the pure vertical integration is going to completely trump um, layers and the value created on the layers. I think that's probably more right than wrong, but the except in investing and in startups, the power law of distribution suggests any exception is is like gold, right? Mm -hmm. So you have one outlier, that's everything. Mm -hmm. Like one outlier, like Facebook or Apple, that trumps like a consistent philosophy. And that's why I think a lot of top-down investors actually wind up in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. Like Kleiner Perkins went through a really tough decade because they're all top-down investors. And one bottom-up mistake is like worth the entire theory being <laughs> sort of wrong or right. Um, so I generally invest, at least on the early stage stuff I've invested in, based upon people, not like some massive like technology predictions. And the people is actually pretty similar to hiring. It's like you know, someone who's got just raw intellect, pretty tenacious or relentlessly resourceful, a little bit contrarian. They're looking for some of actually similar things that I would try to hire for. And you can tell when someone walks in the room often that they have those characteristics. Mm -hmm. Then they're going to educate you about a market or technology disruption that you never even thought of. I mean, I was a big fan of an early you know, proponent of the thesis about this mobile stuff that's now so sort of uh, mainstream that it's, it's boring and trite, but I used to give you know, the speech that um, a couple years ago that you know, people like Peter and Thiel and stuff thought I was crazy, that you could beat any monopoly on the internet with the right mobile product. Mm -hmm. And a little bit of behind some of our hypotheses at Square, but also you know, Instagram being a kind of classic example of that. I don't know that there's a, like, a, a massive, like, obviously non-intuitive, but true technology disruption <laughs> about to occur. I think there's some micro stuff but people are kind of talking about them, so they're not like original hypotheses 
yet. So I'm, I'm more looking, looking for a specific market opportunity and a specific entrepreneur. Like I saw one the other day that I was just in love with. I won't tell you which it is, which company it is, but and they're they're live. But it was just the right entrepreneur with the right vision against something other people have kind of tried before, but without his background. I was like, this is going to be the coolest thing ever. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't wait to invest. What do I need to do? Um, and it, it sounds silly at the superficial level, but as you start digging in deep, you're like, wow, this could be like as big as eBay. Wow, cool. So I'll let you guys invest now. <laughs> Sounds great. So, so, oh, sure, actually, yeah. Do we have uh, questions from the audience for Keith? Come on. Oh, good. <laughs> no one? Uh, so when you talk about identi identifying super young talent that hasn't been validated by the market, um, when you're talking to them, what are the specific things you're talking to a really outstanding uh, intro candidate that you're looking for in that conversation that sort of says, ah, I think this could be one. So usually there's a couple of predictors, I guess. One is they can convey something that's pretty damn complicated that even I might even know a fair amount about and convince me that I'm sort of missing, mis misunderstanding it in a succinct way. Um, so there's a couple, breaking that down, a couple of skills there. Um, just seeing things that I, that I don't see, which is a good sign. Like I'd like to have people around me that see things I don't see. B, that they can convey it in a compelling, persuasive, and succinct way. Because in, in a company, if you can't do that, if you can't frame it, and if you can't do it succinctly, people are just going to ignore you. Like it's really difficult um, to get you know, attention. And when you have someone's attention, you've got to be able to, in a very short period of time, whether it's 140 characters or 10 seconds, be able to explain like why you need to pay attention to this. Um, the relentlessly resourceful part is easy, kind of easy to test for. Actually, there's, there should be things in their history, whether it's on the resume or off the resume, that sort of convey that. The contrarian nature, you know, Peter unfortunately has a great test for this, but he said it publicly, so it's kind of useless now. Which is, you know, explain to me something that you believe that everybody else believes is wrong. So lots of people know that that's an interview question. You know, you get all kinds of stylized answers, um, but something like that where you can see that their brain, you know processes information somewhat differently. Um, there's a little bit of an energy part that's hard to can explain, but it's, it's kind of like someone who's going to just, and it, it relates to the relentlessly resourceful part as well, but someone who's just going to run through walls. And if they can't run through the wall, they're going to jump over the wall, under the wall, somehow become friends with the wall. I don't even know how that works. But like, you can just, you see that, like, and you're just like, wow. Like, in, anytime you have that wow kind of epiphany, then you should hire the person. Um, and you can start like digging in in each of these and probe, but you're going to make some mistakes. The key to this, though, is you will absolutely make some mistakes. Like, there's no way to hire on this model and be perfect. So it's going to be like some high beta. It's like investing in some ways. You're going to have some high beta successes. You will have some abysmal failures. There's one person I hired at Square that I still get texts about from some of my mm -hmm. colleagues about like, what the hell were you thinking? Um, and it's some pretty graphic ones. <laughs> um, <laughs> So like you know, it's like drafting athletes. Out, and I joke about it, but it's like as a sports person, you're going to draft people out of college or high school. Don't expect to be zero defects, but the the, the home runs are going to trump like you know a lot of uh, a, you can't have a lot of mistakes, but home runs will clearly trump in terms of value creation um, a couple of mistakes. Another question. So just along those lines, when, you know, if you're a cash strap startup, you know find a person that's like amazing, do you hire for the person rather than the role? I would, actually. I know that's challenging in terms of how cash strap, I mean, there, there are obviously like, you know, uh, sort of facts um, that are a little bit more specific, but I generally would. Um, and if you can persuade them, you know, like there's, there's ways to persuade them, less, you know, less cash, more equity. When we raise money, you know, you will get X, yeah, Y cash. Um, Maybe potentially even raising more cash than you thought you would. Um, maybe raising, you know, there's there's a set of options if someone's really spectacular, but you can't go back. It's really hard to find spectacular people. And anything you can do when you have them really interested in what you're trying to do, I would try to close that every time. One more question, Leah. So they're somewhat different, actually. Of the places I've been at, they're all like kind of unique animals. It's kind of 
kind of like a cult. Each, each successful startup is kind of like a cult. It has a certain sort of set of beliefs and way of acting, and it becomes sort of self-fulfilling. So like PayPal is very different than Square, and PayPal, Square, and LinkedIn are very, very different. Um, so for example, Square is heavily design-driven. Not very quantitatively driven, actually. Um, you do have to pay attention to some things when you're moving a lot of money around. You know, you've probably seen Office, Office Space or Superman 6. Like, it's pretty important that you know where the money's going, like down to the fractional, you know, for the unit. But fundamentally, nothing at Square is really driven by metrics. It's really driven by vision of what people want to see in the world, what's a better product, what's a better experience, and then measuring, using metrics to measure if we're sort of right or wrong. You have to sell movie tickets after you produce the movie. You don't just want to have a, a critically acclaimed movie, you want a blockbuster. At PayPal, like everything, Peter is the most lo logical, rational, you know, sort of empirical guy in the world. Emotions don't matter. Anything that's soft, like Peter would completely exclude. Um, so it's completely different. Um, so I think what you have to do is um, sort of craft a culture that's based upon sort of your vision and the market opportunity and your talent. Like you could take a, if you have like, if you don't have world-class designers, building a design-oriented company probably doesn't make the most sense. Similarly, if you don't have world-class, like, now what are called data scientists, but basically just people who are good at quant stuff, um, building a empirically-based company probably doesn't make the most sense. So you sort of have to combine, like, sort of, like, the strategy, and this is why there's a book I, I, Jack and I both really love, um, written by uh, Bill Walsh, published you know, after he died, and it's called The Score Takes Care of Itself. And one of the lessons that you learn from that is your strategy needs to be completely tied to the talent you have, which has to reflect back in the culture you build, and it's all like one circle. So I don't think there's like some formula of like you do it this way and it works. It's like, well, given what you're trying to accomplish, like Elon builds his companies, you know, very differently than others would, but given what he's trying to accomplish, which is incredibly like almost absurd when he starts, it's the only way probably to succeed at those kind of companies. So I, I think it's like it's not it's not like there's some formula like you just tap into and paint by numbers. Very good. So Keith, thank you so oh, much for you. coming. This has been Thanks. a great, 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 great time. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.